Attack and the Power of Juju, a series of 3D platformers from the early 2000s that, surprisingly, I haven't seen many people talk about. So let's change that, eh? Before we get into this whole thing, I want to make it clear that I'm only talking about the original three games in this video. I I'm not going to talk about the show or the games post the original trilogy, because to keep it real, I think they kinda suck ass. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about some video games, dudes! So before I get into the game proper, I actually want to bring up something about the physical side of this game I really like, which is the manual. Manuals are kind of a relic of a bygone era. Hell, I wouldn't even be surprised if some people nowadays are just too young to even remember video game manuals. And you know, that's kind of a shame. I know they're kind of impractical at this point, and even back then they could have just given us this information in game, but at the same time, I really loved manuals because I always saw them as cool side content when they were done well. Whoever wrote these things would sometimes include a lot of fun details like extra lore bits and character information and so on. There's also just the charm to having a physical object to read in my hands over reading game tips in like a loading screen or something. It honestly kind of reminds me of how, while I think streaming is generally more viable than going to a store and renting a physical movie, that still doesn't mean I don't miss places like Blockbuster because of how much more charming I found them. Seriously, there is infinitely more pleasure to walking into a nice little store filled with movies, TV shows, and video games to rent for the weekend than mindlessly scrolling through Netflix for 20 minutes and finally just putting some random bullshit on because you've been doing this for too long and you just don't care anymore. That was a tangent. Let's finish up talking about the manual so I can show you these weird-ass platformers already. And what a manual this is, by the way. It's definitely one of the best I've ever seen. The graphic design is clean, readable, appealing, and fits the game's tone really well. The majority of it is written from the perspective of one of the main characters, which is incredibly endearing, and best of all, it has an ad for a game on the back that I am definitely gonna talk about in the future someday. Wait, what the fuck? Why are those stretch like... That's not what that boss is supposed to... What the fuck? For a game that looks this interesting, it was a little surprising to find out the story for the first one was pretty... basic, all things considered. That's not a bad thing, of course. I think what they try to do with the story is executed well enough. Let me summarize the plot real quick before I get into the deeper details. So basically, the deal is that there's this evil guy named Claylock, and he's jealous of Jabulba's Dan Schneider attracting feet. No! And he's jealous that Jabulba was given the role of village shaman. Because of this, he turns everyone in the village, besides Jabulba and Tak, into sheep. Thus, Tak has to do some shenanigans to save his people, like assaulting animals, bringing his friend back from the dead by going to what is basically purgatory, meeting what are essentially actually for real gods, and finally defeating Claylock and his minions, pins and needles. You know, standard platformer stuff. You know, actually, when worded like that, it sounds a lot less basic, but trust me, as strange as the details are, the actual execution of the plot is a fairly straightforward and pretty simple take on the hero's journey trope. Again, that's not a bad thing. I think tropes are fine as long as they're executed well enough, at least. Not that any of this really matters, because the actual plot of this game, and hell, all of the games, isn't all that important to me. I much more enjoy the characters and their dynamics, the atmosphere, the music, and the voice acting especially is a standout. Most of the voice actors aren't super common to hear in the industry, besides Rob Paulson and maybe Jennifer Hale, and I really appreciate that, because I'm not hearing Tom Kenny or Tara Strong for the 4,000th time. Jason Marsden and Jeff Bennett, I think, are the best examples. Jason plays Tack, and his voice is really fitting. I especially love how in the second and third games, he made Tack sound a bit older, because Tack 2 and 3 are set like a year or two after the first game, and that's just a nice touch. My name is Tack. Uh, I'm here on an important mission. Okay, now. What about some help getting down the river? With it on, I can glide on currents of air and drop exploding eggs from above. Jeff plays a couple of the titular Jujus in all three games, as well as both pins and needles, and he's got great range to boot. My personal favorite tack role he does is the caged Juju, who's a bloodthirsty beast that talks with a pompous accent. <laughs> So glad you could stop by. Oh, also Patrick Warburton is here, and he plays my favorite character in the entire series. The one, the only, the Giga Chad, Locke. Locke is a god amongst men. He is the prophesized hero of the Pupununu people. He is the one true... Actually, he's just kind of a pathetic but well-meaning guy. 
Oh yeah, there's like a whole prophecy thing going on in the background of the story, and they try to act like Locke is the hero of that prophecy, but it's really obvious even from the get-go that Tack is the actual hero. I mean, for God's sake, the game was called Tack and the Power of Juju, not Locke and the Power of Juju. To be fair, I'm pretty sure they weren't trying to hide it either, but... God, this is so unimportant, who gives a shit? Oh, and Jamulba is voiced by the fucking Crypt Keeper? I didn't have anywhere else to put that, but I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that fact. <laughs> Also, the music is very good, and I'm just gonna talk about all three games' music here, because there's really no point to stretch this particular topic through three separate sections throughout the video. The music is very memorable, very fitting, and works really well towards setting these games' atmosphere. I mean, just give some of these a listen. Good shit, right? One last thing, and my favorite thing for this part, I adore how these games look. Whether it's the character design or the background art, there isn't anything in these games that I don't find drop-dead gorgeous. Sure, graphically they haven't held up to today's standards, but stylistically these games have aged like fine wine. Seriously, I would love to see these games get the Psychonauts 2 treatment, because I feel like Double Fine took the first Psychonauts style and really amplified it with modern graphical capabilities in 2, and I'd love to see the same thing happen in the TAC series. Anyway, for the most part, I think that's all I've got for this section, which means it's time to get to the meat of this video game. You know, the video game part. I'm gonna be real with you, out of all of these games, my least favorite to play is this one. I don't think the gameplay is bad, but... well, let's just get into it. Attack in the Power of Juju is a collect-a-thon 3D platformer a la Mario 64, Banjo-Kazooie, and a million other types of games like this that you've probably already heard of before. And that's where the problems begin for me. There's nothing wrong with that style of 3D platformer, some of the best and my favorite 3D platformers are collectathons. And while I don't think TAC 1 executes the collectathon style poorly, there's something about it that just doesn't click with me entirely. Like, the level design is sound, if a bit basic, and they lay things out well with collectibles leading you to places they want you to go and jump around and stuff and all that jazz, but I guess part of why it doesn't work for me is because it kind of feels like that's all they do. For instance, in Mario 64 and other similar games, there's usually more to do than just platforming to get collectibles. Maybe you'll have to race a character to get a star, or figure out what order you need to open a chest, and various other tasks of the like. Whereas in Tac 1, all you're doing for the most part to get the major collectibles is just going somewhere and platforming, and maybe some very rudimentary puzzle solving, and that's about it. And the platforming is fun, but I guess I just wish there was a bit more to do. Collectible placement can also feel a bit aimless at times too, just wanted to throw that in there. There is one aspect of the gameplay I really love though. Throughout the game you often run into animal puzzles. Some are simple, you just need to lead an animal away from or towards something, but some are a bit more interesting than that. Some will require you to utilize multiple animals for the different abilities they have, and move them around to not get in the way of any of the other animals. It's not the deepest concept, and it's done better in future entries, but the way it's executed in the first game is still really good. I'll tell you what isn't really good though, this tutorial sucks ass! This is the first time you see Jennifer Hale's character, Flora. I didn't bring her up in the previous section because I don't think Flora is all that interesting as a character. Like, she's nice, I guess, and she hangs around Tack for most of the game, so that's kinda neat. She's better in the second game. Not that any of that matters, because the first time you meet her, you're forced into one of the most uninteresting, hand-holding tutorials I've ever played. And look, I'm not against tutorials, but I am against them when they constantly make it so that you can't turn the camera to teach me how to turn the camera. Thankfully, once you beat the tutorial and sort of the first level, you basically have free reign to go wherever you want, whenever you want. That first level gives you something really neat, actually, yeah. When you finish up the first section there, you get a staff that you can switch to that lets you jump higher and further. What I find really cool about that is that you can still switch back to your original weapon, which allows you to double jump and roll, two things you can't do with the staff. I really like that there are ups and downs to both weapon choices. It leaves a lot of how the player plays up to their discretion. And, uh, I think one of the last things I want to talk about here is the boss fights. Yeah, let's just get through them real quick. They're not... awful. They're not really all that special, which is especially felt since you have to fight the same one like nine times. Thank god those fights are short. The final boss isn't really all that special either, honestly. You get turned into a chicken, which is kind of funny, I guess, but that's about the only real highlight. Oh god, that just reminded me of... Okay, so earlier in the game you get this chicken suit that you can glide with, and... It's bad. It's just bad. Unlike the rest of the game, it doesn't control very well, and gliding is so insanely slow that I have to assume it was a mistake. 
Okay, I have to end this section off with something a bit more positive. Uh... Oh, there's something that only this game in the series really does that I think is pretty cool and well executed. So at certain points in some levels, you'll notice things that you can't get to or can't really interact with when you find them, and it's usually because you haven't progressed far enough in the rest of the game yet. And look, I get that this is a thing that especially a lot of other platformers do, but I still think it's worth praise whenever it shows up and definitely when it's executed as well as it is here. Oh, also there's a magic system, I guess? It's not really worth discussing, honest. Anyway, capitalism! Okay, so being 100% honest, this is probably my favorite thing to come out of this franchise, and that's entirely because of how fascinating I find it. Like, the tech games were never very popular, or at least not relevant even when they were coming out, but I guess the first and second games sold well enough for them to do a McDonald's tie-in with the third game that's based on the second game? I don't know either, man. Just go with it. And man, these toys are kind of weird. Some of them make sense, or at least kind of neat, but then there are some where I just don't understand what they were thinking when designing them? I think the best way to explain what I mean is just by talking about all of them one at a time. I spent real actual money on these. Also, as a quick aside, I was going to use my own footage for this, but there were technical issues that I don't care enough to fix, so I'm just going to use some footage I found on YouTube. Thanks to Juanito Camargo, I guess. I hope I pronounced your name right, by the way, if you ever see this. Okay, so already we're off to an interesting start. The feature for this one, I guess, makes sense, but the way they implemented it is... baffling? So you bend his leg, set him down, and he jumps. Right, so why the fuck do I need to break this child's leg to get him to jump? This isn't even the only toy in this line with that feature, and it's better implemented in the other toy, which we'll get to because that one makes no fucking sense. Other than that though, this one is understandable enough, I guess. It's based off the main character of a platformer, he jumps in the game, sure, fine, it works. They probably could have done something more interesting, but I'm not creative enough to tell you what that could have been. I mean, this is basically a video essay, so I'm already a hack. Also, I don't know why Tack has the full staff of dreams. He never uses the whole staff in the entire game, only the dream half. Just go to the next toy. This one is my second favorite of these weird things. The feature is dead simple, but unbelievably fitting. So what you do is, you squeeze the arms, and his chest flexes. Which is brilliant. Right, Whoever designed this one deserves... Like, yeah, what's going on? A raise? Hey, what Jack, the fuck? You wanna play Why is it talking? This toy isn't supposed to the talk. There isn't even a place for batteries. Oh, it's really oh my god, this is so annoying. Does it ever stop? Shut up! Shut so, yeah. shut the fuck up! Like the shut up! Shut up! Remember that other jumping toy I talked about a minute ago? Yeah, I bet you didn't guess it'd be for fucking Jabulba. <laughs> Genuinely, I'd love to meet the designer of this specific toy and pick their brain. Because I really, really want to know what made them think it was at all fitting to give the not at all agile old man character the ability to do this. What the fuck? This would almost make sense if it was based off of Jabulba's tick transformation from the second game, which we'll get to hold your horses, but this is a normal, regular, non-platforming old man, and yet they still decided to give him this feature of all things? I have to assume that they did this because, let's be honest, the people who were making these toys probably one, barely knew anything about the characters besides what they were told, two, probably didn't care, and three, weren't paid enough to care. But I care, goddammit. I care. No, I don't. Who would genuinely give a shit about this kind of thing? This one's not all that interesting, so we're gonna move past it pretty quick, but for the sake of completion, I still want to talk about it, obviously. You lift Playlock's arms up, and a red light turns on in his chest. Like I said, not very interesting, but at least it looks cool in the dark. This isn't one of my favorites, but I also still kind of love it. What this one does is really simple, but it is super fitting for the character and is also just really funny. So there's a button on Pins' back, you press it and his arms do this. And every time I see it, I can't help but think of some dumb shit like Hey, does anybody want coffee? Who wants coffee? Don't ever fucking film me, I'm gonna kick the shit out of you! It just... It just always brings a smile to my face, you know? This is another one I really don't understand. Like, just look at this and you tell me what's wrong with this picture. If you haven't guessed yet, Needles never does this in any of the games ever, as far as I'm aware. This one is definitely the most baffling one of them all to me, because even as, like, a toy action feature, what kid would want a toy that does this? Just... just baffling. 
Like Tlaylock, there's not really a whole lot to say here, although I do like this one a bit more than Tlaylock's toy. All you can do with this one is twist around various appendages, but every time you do it makes like these little clicking sounds. I guess to represent his bones shattering into a million tiny little pieces, and I just find that quite comical. Also, I'm biased towards this one because Dead Juju is just... he's a treat, and we'll talk about him a bit more when we get to Tack 2. Ah, the final toy. This one is my favorite, hands down. The feature for this one, unlike every other one of these toys, is 100% accurate to how this character is in Tack 2. Yep, that's all he does. And it's perfect. 10 out of 10, couldn't ask for more. I'm not memeing by the way, I genuinely love this one the most out of all of them because I for real actually think this is fucking hilarious. Just look at this thing. Anyway, that's it for the toys, let's get back to the fucking video games, baby! Starting with the manual again, and honestly, while I still like this one, I don't think it's as good as the first game's manual. I don't think it's as striking or memorable as the graphic design Attack 1's manual, but I do gotta say the color choices are still pretty goddamn fantastic. That shade of green against the cyan background makes everything pop really well, and while I'd say it's weaker than its predecessor, it's still pretty clean. That said, not much else to say about this one. Besides graphic design, I think it does everything else just as well as the original game's manual. Like the first game, we're gonna get right into the story, which this time I think is actually a lot more interesting. It doesn't fall back on the hero's journey trope that much this time around. I mean, by the end of the first game, Tack's already the hero, he doesn't really have to prove himself again. I think that really let them have some more freedom, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The second game starts with Tack waking up to find himself still asleep. I cannot believe I wrote that. Awoken in this mysterious subconscious realm, Tack is told by a mysterious new Juju that calls itself the Dream Juju that Tack must make it through the dream world to stop the dream guardian and save a princess locked away. Yeah, Tack doesn't buy this shit for a second and only obliges because he's told he may never wake up again if he doesn't, which is fucking hilarious. After a short, and much better than the first game's, tutorial, Tack is back in the waking world and finds himself surrounded by Jabulba and Locke. After telling both of them what happened in his dream, Jabulba sets out to help Tack get more in tune with the mental world. And so they must quest to find Jabulba's brother, who has a lot of know-how on all this weird dream shit. Of course, not before he sends Locke away on a fake errand to get rid of him because he's a fucking simp. Oh, you better get going. Wouldn't want anybody else to rescue that princess. After a whole bunch of video game, Tack and Jabulba finally make it to Jabulba's brother, who is named JB, which is short for Jabulba's brother. I swear the guy that wrote this thinks he's so funny, and he's so fucking right. Oh, also while Tax thing is happening, Locke manages to catch up a few times and even befriends a Juju along the way that just decides to tack along because hey, why not, right? And that Juju is dead Juju. And I love dead Juju. This is, honest to god, one of my favorite performances from Rob Paulson. He plays this undead party dude character so well, and it's so ungodly charming to just watch this dumb skeleton wearing a Hawaiian shirt fumble around and be a goofy doofus that you just can't help but fall a little in love with him. Back to Tack's whole thing, after saving JB from some of the worst video game design I've had the displeasure of playing, he hooks Tack into a dream machine so he can finally save the princess and defeat the dream guardian. So yeah, he does that, and it turns out, one, the Dream Guardian was not the bad guy, and in fact was pretty important to keeping the balance of dreams and nightmares. Two, the princess wasn't actually a princess, but instead was pins and needles in disguise. And three, the Dream Juju was actually just Tlaylock, who was tricking Tack into getting the Staff of Dreams. Roll credits. But seriously, this thing is pretty important. Like, reality-bending important. And while Tlaylock doesn't manage to get away with the whole staff, he still has half of one of the most powerful magic items in this universe. Like, the half Tlaylock gets lets him and his minions open portals to pretty much anywhere, and also breaking it in half causes the dream world and the waking world to start to merge. But hey, you can hit stuff with the half you got, I guess. After a whole bunch more video game, Tack obviously defeats Tlaylock, saves his friends in the world, gives the staff of dreams back to the Guardian, and wakes up. Yep, that's right, the whole game didn't happen. Maybe. I don't know, dude. This ending kinda sucks, and therefore I pretend it's not canon and didn't happen. It never happened. I mean, it kinda gets retconned in 3 a little bit anyway, but, you know. Real quick, before we move on to the next section, I want to bring up the aesthetic of the dream world. I adore this art direction. I think this personally is the most interesting and original take on a dreamscape I've ever seen in pretty much any media ever. The use of those specific shades of greens and blues for the land masses in this place, combined with those ethereal skyboxes that both eventually turn darker and sharper and scarier the closer you get to the Dream Guardian, all adds up to this just gorgeous take on a location based on dreams. Alright, I'm done gushing, on to the video game part again. 
Tech 2 is a stark improvement in the gameplay department. Everything from the first game that just made it feel kind of bloated is gone. Tack now has a meter for magic that as the game goes on lets you amp up your attacks, doing more damage, and also gives Tack the ability to sprint, which is just a fun addition to the platforming aspect. The combat has also been given a bit more depth too, although it's not the most interesting combat around. I mean, it is a 3D platformer from the early 2000s, they were basically required to just have okay at best combat, but, you know, it is nice that it's a bit more than just the generic 3-hit combo you got from most games of this era, although that is also here still too. Something new this time around is Jabulba, actually. So, remember how I brought up earlier that Jabulba becomes a tick in this game? That's actually a gameplay mechanic. He's used to play into the animal puzzles, which have had a major upgrade. None of the puzzles are head-scratchers in any of the games, really, but they're definitely better executed here than in the first game, and a lot more fun, too. Oh, you know, talking about that, near the end of the game you can actually turn into some animals and use those for some pretty cool puzzles too. There's even this super neat part right before the penultimate boss where you chase pins and needles while constantly changing into several animals so you can use their abilities to keep up with them. God, the stuff they do with the animal puzzles in this one is so fun. Another major change is the level design. For the most part, the game is as linear as it gets. Instead of big open areas to explore and find trinkets to collect and stuff, it's a straight line from start to finish. There is still a lot of collecting to do, but most of it's optional this time, and I gotta be real, I prefer this style of 3D platformer over the standard collectathon. That's probably blasphemy to some people, but, you know, preferences and all that. I love 3D World more than Mario 64, you can't even BEGIN to get on my level! But yeah, for the most part, I think the level design of TAC 2 is so many steps above the original game, with one exception. And man, this exception makes me so sad because visually it is easily my favorite level, but it's a fucking shitty turret level with barely any platforming. Yeah, this is that aforementioned the worst video game design I've had the displeasure of playing part I was talking about a little bit ago, which to be honest, was hyperbole for the sake of the joke. It's not the worst thing ever, but it is the worst part of this game and that genuinely does make me a little sad. But yeah, honestly, besides that, I've got no real other complaints. Oh, one more thing I really like about specifically the last few levels in the game, they go back to the collectathon style of platformer for them and they pull it off really well and it's such a cute little love letter to the first game style of design that I just find really endearing. Oh, also, there's another kinda just okay final boss here. It's better than the first games, but there's still not much to say on it, so... Attack 3, I guess. Alright, I'm not gonna drag this out, this is the weakest of all three manuals. It's not awful, but its graphic design just doesn't do much for me. It's pretty basic looking, which is fine, it gets the point across, but I just can't help but feel a little disappointed still. The other two manuals, especially the first one, look so fantastic, while this one just looks... competent, we'll say competent, yeah. I should say though, I still think all three manuals look really good, especially in comparison to a lot of other manuals at the time. I just wish that this final one hit the mark, you know? Tech 3 is easily my favorite of the trilogy. Not much to add to that, I just wanted to get that statement out of the way. Also, not a whole lot of plot to talk about this time, it's pretty simple really. Tack and Locke join the titular Juju Challenge, something that only comes around every 60 years, where several different tribes compete for the favor of the Moon Juju, who I think I haven't even brought up this whole video, even though she's kind of important to the first game. Eh, I don't have much to say about her even if she is still enjoyable as a character. Also, inevitably they win, but not before almost being cheated out of winning by this dude, Dark Juju, who's super horny and wants to fuck the Moon Juju. Yeah, that's about it for the plot, which is fine by me because a lot more emphasis was put on the character moments between Tack and Locke, both in cutscenes and in gameplay. I love what these dudes have going on in this game. It's this perfectly executed big brother, little brother dynamic that leads into what is some of the best comedy in this series. I haven't really brought this up, so I might as well bring it up now before the video ends, but these games are really funny. Like, really fucking funny. And Tech 3 is easily the funniest of them all, at least to me. And almost all of it is thanks to that previously mentioned dynamic between Tack and Locke. Having joined the competition together, they both, you know, have to work together, and because they're both kind of idiots, they butt heads with each other often, but in that sibling kind of way. You know, that endearing way that you only really know of if you grew up with an older or younger sibling, and it leads to just great moments like this. The Locke called it first, the Locke gets it! Do you know what that is, Locke? Yes. It's mine. It's for underwater exploration. And it's all yours. Uh, too bad I'm not tall enough to wear that suit. Sure glad you are. Thanks, big buddy. I hate you. That said, there's not much else to talk about for Tac 3 that isn't gameplay related, really. There are some other moments with other characters, but they're very short. One of my favorites is with Tlaylock, actually. Instead of being the big bad of this game, he actually helps Tag and Lock out a little bit, since all three of them are from the Pupanunu tribe. Actually, that reminds me, there's another part where, in between challenges, Jabulba is telling Tag and Lock about how in the previous Great Juju Challenge it was Tlaylock and him that competed for the Pupanunu people. And I just think that's neat. I guess I should also bring up the reuse of assets, yeah. 
Tag 3 reuses a lot of stuff from the first two games, and I can see that probably bothering some people, but I gotta be real. I've always been a proponent for devs reusing as many things as they can get away with from previous projects. I'm not a super fan of the shit most devs have to deal with, so anything that makes their lives easier is good in my book. Not to mention, I think Tag 3 reuses assets in a way that, for the most part, makes them feel fresh again, which is always the best way to do that kind of thing. Oh, one last thing for this part, the animation in this one is really good for the era. The character acting is on point, and everyone is more expressive than ever. The first two games had fine animation, but man, and is Tac 3 definitely a good couple steps above on that front? And I got nothing else to say, methinks, so let's get into how this bitch plays already. <laughs> Tac 3 plays almost exactly the same as Tac 2. Like, besides level design, which we'll get to, everything from Tac 2, barring Tick Jibulba and turning into animals, is back. But that's fine, because the new stuff really adds some new fun. Locke is playable this time, and not in the Kirby 64 way where you sometimes got to play as DDD every once in a while. No, Locke is playable from Jump, alongside Tac, because this game is a co-op multiplayer 3D platformer. Which, if you're anything like me, is the coolest sentence anyone could say about any video game ever. And this isn't caught up in the A Hat in Time Mario 3D World way, where you can play the games alone and nothing really changes. This game is co-op down to its core. Every level is designed with Tack and Lock using the abilities they have together to get through them. And I love that! I love that Tack has abilities that Lock doesn't have, and vice versa. It forces people to use both of them in some simple but really engaging cooperative platforming. And the craziest part to me is that this game is just as fun in single player as it is in multiplayer. You see, you can switch between Tack and Lock in single player, and while on paper this might sound a little clunky, switching is so fast and responsive that it never led to any issues for me. And God, the level design! It's like they took the level design of Tack 2 and gave it speed. The way the levels and just the whole game is designed is around going as fast as you can while working together with your partner. Since the whole game is based around this big competition, you're not just playing normally, you're under a time limit this time. And I know that doesn't sound great to some people, but for me it leads to what is easily the fastest paced gameplay of the entire series, and I fucking love that aspect of the game. For the most part, the time limit is pretty generous, but even then, that sense of dread from not making time really pushes you into upping the pace. There's also very few moments that drag the game down, definitely nothing on the level of that turret part from the second game. There are these weird demolition derby sections that you have to do, one of which being the final thing you do in the game that are fine, I guess. I don't love them, but they're inoffensive at worst. The final one kinda sucks though, not gonna lie. Man, all three of these games had pretty weak endings, honestly. At least in terms of gameplay. Oh well, it's all about the journey, not the destination, and blah blah blah. Okay, so I wrote a lot of that last part before recording footage for this, and I forgot just how awful the final part of Tac 3 is. In the previous three demolition derby parts you had to do, they weren't fun, but they were forgivable. There was plenty of leeway, as long as you weren't in last place, you'd be good. In the final one though, it's just your team versus another team, and the other team cheats. That wouldn't even be such a problem if these shitty cars didn't suck major ass to control. It genuinely feels like you're fighting the game just to turn the way you need to go, and none of it is fun. It doesn't help that you have to go through three rounds of this shit and win each time. And of course it's too fucking long, too. Like, nearly ten minutes too fucking long. And again, if you mess up once, you're going back to the first round, which, if that happens near the end of the final round and you nearly win twice... Yeah, safe to say I really, really don't like this part. And I tried everything, man. I tried so many strategies in every single car multiple times over. At some point, I just won. I couldn't even tell you how, the whole thing just felt like pure luck. And it's such a shame, because almost everything before this horrible final section I legitimately think is some of the most fun I've ever had with a 3D platformer. I still love this game even after all of that too, there's too much good going for it for this shitty part to ruin it all, but man, the endgame for Tac 3 is... rough. Maybe it's easier with a friend, I don't know. So, the Tech Trilogy is something I've come to adore most, warts and all, and I just love so many things about all three of them. Their aesthetics and music is unlike almost anything I've seen or heard from video games, their gameplay while nothing new is tightly and competently made. These games are unbelievably polished for the era. The writing is surprisingly good for this type of game, especially from the early 2000s. And I gotta say, I don't know how there's so little conversation surrounding these games. They're straight up diamonds in the rough. Seriously, I've played a lot of platformers from this era that I don't think are nearly as good as these ones that somehow get way more discussion in modern day platforming circles. I just don't get it, but hey, here's hoping these games come back in some way, somehow. THQ Nordic does own the license again, so anything's possible. Seriously, a remaster of at least the third game with online co-op would be the sickest shit ever. I am begging for this to become a reality, THQ.